one thing that is very uh, critical in when we're looking at the workforce is that we're finding that, say, the millennial generation, the Generation Z employees, they need to be constantly challenged. They need to be constantly educated. They need to have that opportunity for promotions. And what we're seeing is if that isn't happening, they're switching companies. Welcome to another episode of Relocation Leader. I'm your host, Zach Turbis, and today we have a very special guest. We have Bill Larson, who is a client relations manager with NEI Global Relocation. Welcome, Bill. Well, thank you, Zach. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And today we are talking about Peak 65. And if you don't know what Peak 65 is, today Bill is going to tell us. So, you know, Bill, before we get started, do you want to just give a brief introduction on um, kind of you, who you are, what you do? Sure. I'm, uh, again, name is Bill Larson. I'm the client relations manager here at uh, NEI, one of many, and been at NEI for a couple of years now, but I have over 22 years of experience in the relocation industry, starting way back when uh, being a realtor for relocation on to becoming an account executive, senior management, and then onto the client relations role. So, uh, it's been quite a journey, quite an interesting journey, and um, I'm sure most of us can agree you're never bored any day of the week. Yeah, I'm curious, what, what do you enjoy most about the uh, being a client relations manager? It's long-term relationships. When you are, say, an account executive working with transferees, it's a, it's a short-term relationship. Strong, important, intense, obviously. Uh, but those folks move on to their lives. And with a client relations manager role, I have years of time with my client contacts and working on their programs. So you can see things moving over a several year process to fruition. So whether it's you know looking at industry standards and updating policies, uh, advising them of new things that are coming up that uh, they should be aware of, I'm here to help guide them to a very successful, efficient, and cost-effective program. For instance, Peak 65. And uh, I know you're trying to segue right to it. And let's, <laughs> let's give you that opportunity. Okay, so what is Peak 65 and should we all be afraid? I'll start, start with statistics because, you know, one number can uh, take care of a thousand pictures, I always say. But the U.S. Department of Labor projects that in July of 2024, more than 12,000 U.S. workers per day will reach retirement age, which is on an average 65. Now, that's an additional 2,000 a day that's increased over from the early part of the year. And that number though is peaking now, will remain substantial for a number of years. Now by 2030, and that's just what, five and a half short years from now, all baby boomers, all those born between 1946 and 1964 will be at least 65, which again, like I said, is the average retirement age. So that that's a concern. Um, and part of my role, certainly as a client relations manager, as I said before, is determine what changes are happening in the industry, what the trends are, and how can we address those and how they may impact our clients. So, you know, I've been hearing about this lack of uh, experience and expertise, not by attrition, but from retirements. All of us in our own industries have had that happen significantly and with an increasing degree, I believe. And what clients are finding it, it's difficult finding the right people to fill those roles. So that kind of led to my research. You know, what is the forecast of retirements over the next five or six years? How's it being addressed? Um, and the peak 65 term, I want to give proper uh, credit to, this was coined by Jason Fitchner, who did a wonderful paper uh, involving uh, retirement incomes, more or less, but uh, he coined the phrase peak 65. He's uh, the executive director of the Alliance for Lifetime Income. And uh, the peak 65 term has taken on a life unto itself. And it's, it's now morphed to the point where it's talking all about uh, what are we doing about this drain, particularly in the experience and expertise that's out there right now. With that, 
I'm curious if you could sort of expound on what the impact is looking like that it will be uh, just on the workforce in general. Yeah, it's going to be substantial. Um, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, by 2030, the U.S. is expected to have 8.5 million new jobs created. And considering the accelerating retirement rate and the slowed birth rate in the U.S., the labor force is expected to increase only 6.5 million. That means 2 million jobs that we have no one to take. And uh, maybe another statistic, uh, this one gets quoted a lot. Uh, ADP reports there's today there are 0.6 applicants for every job available. By 2030, with everything we're all going to be doing to ensure we have a, an adequate workforce, it's only going to increase by one-tenth of a point, so 0 0.7. So we're going to go from 0.6 applicants to 0.7 applicants by the 2030. So again, we're still going to be short 2 million positions. What shocked me uh, was, you know, the impact that we're seeing, it's going to be a lot on like higher level positions because when people are close to retirement age, typically they've climbed the ladder, you know, and so you have a lot of very influential positions um, that could potentially be vacated and to have you know, a 2 million uh, position gap <laughs> where a majority of those could be higher level, you know, more intense positions. That That is something to, to note, isn't it? It certainly is. And uh, that's a, a reality. And what we're seeing is, would you like me to give an example? I One that fits this question perfectly, actually. <laughs> yeah, is, absolutely. Um, I pulled some of my clients on this very issue. Are they seeing an impact with retirements and how is that, how are they handling that internally? And one of my clients expressed this really, really deep concern that they have senior level executives retiring out. And what they're discovering is that the junior level, you know, the ones that are moving their way up towards that senior position uh, are not fitting the bill. They don't have the experience. They don't have the, uh, the wherewithal of what those positions entail to really take up those positions. And, you know, there's a million reasons why that happens. But uh, one thing that is very uh, critical in when we're looking at the workforce is that we're finding that, say, the millennial generation, the Generation Z employees, they need to be constantly challenged. They need to be constantly educated. They need to have that opportunity for promotions. And what we're seeing is if that isn't happening, they're switching companies. You know, look back on our dads. They were at one company for their entire career. Um, NEI is a real anomaly in that we have unbelievable tenure here. Uh, people at 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, five years experience, you're considered a newbie still. But that's really an anomaly in the in industries out there. So it's important that we talk about how are we going to offer opportunities to those junior executives. And, you know, we can talk about that in a minute. What do we do to ensure that they stay with that organization and learn the nuances of that particular position within that company so they can take over those senior positions coming up? Absolutely. And did you, did you say you had another example as well? I do. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, I had uh, one of my clients tell me that, that they can't replace the line workers that are assembling machinery. So we have these folks that have been doing this for years and years, and they have the experience how to solve a problem while on the line, while looking at something that's happening immediately with immediate impact. And they solve these problems without slowing production. And that's critical. So even though they're opposite ends of the spectrum, I mean, think about it. Either one of these positions can cost the company millions of dollars in lost productivity. So when we're talking about, you know, impact on the workforce, you have the gap, right? Um, and you have companies trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to bridge that gap? Uh, what are the solutions? What are um, companies and HR departments thinking about right now uh, when it comes to, you know, figuring out what to do with that gap? Well, if talking to HR departments, and I, I am no, I'm not going to imply that I'm an expert on human resource programs. I'm a relocation person. Uh, but the Society for Human Resource Management uh, has made a several suggestions, and probably two of the biggest ones is when you're looking for more experienced workers, uh, expand your search regionally, globally even. 
It's important also that your advertising is inclusive for all ages. Uh, terms like energetic, high potential, uh, those can apply only younger workers should apply. And uh, you're losing a lot of talented, experienced people by kind of uh, focusing a little bit on a younger crowd with those kinds of words. So are we thinking also that a lot of people who may be closer to 65, closer to retirement, are now um, open to staying on with companies um, if they're treated right? Is that kind of what you were, you were saying? Yeah, I think uh, there's enticements that you can offer to somebody that wants to, uh, that is interested in staying on longer. Because, you know, again, we're talking about can we keep somebody on a five extra years and take advantage of all that experience? And um, as a second, well, probably as a primary really is offer opportunities for those more experienced workers to train the younger groups. And so we, we're talking about training opportunities. We're talking about rotational programs. So um, there's probably a twofold way to talk about that. Number one, as I said before, younger workers, they desire that training and opportunity for growth. So an excellent way to do that is a rotational program. So you take these younger, less experienced workers and rotate them through different company locations to sit with the more experienced managerial types and learn more of the job of the, the organization and the skills that they need. And that is a kind of exciting opportunity that uh, younger workers certainly want. Another way to approach this is also from the experienced worker standpoint, they can also go on a rotational program and visit different or different buildings, different locations for the organization and offer that same training. One, one of the ways that is, seems to be catching on some interest, aside from that rotational program, which I think is excellent, and uh, I'm seeing that implemented uh, in many places, but we've done something that's a little bit newer, and I, I, it actually has a resurgence. It was something years ago that some people did and uh, discovered that there's a renewed interest in that, and that's enticing people to extend their retirement age. So can we have them for a couple extra years? Can we have them for an additional five years, whatever? Uh, there's you know always a bonus you can offer somebody, uh, an opportunity to travel, like we talked about rotationals, or a... Uh, Final retirement move. Uh, I, I initially called that final move, but that uh, that brings up gravestone. So I don't think we want to call it that. But a retirement move is something that is gaining some traction. And in, what in this case is, we take an experienced worker and they agree to stay on beyond their retirement date, and they're offered a move. So picture an employee that maybe does you know goes on assignment. Doesn't have to be domestic. It could be international. They go on assignment for a particular number of years, a particular number of months, um, or they agree to stay on and do some additional training for the younger workers. Uh, when they've reached that end of that time frame, we offer them a move. Because uh, a lot of people that are retiring want to move somewhere else. They're living in a four bedroom house that they no longer need. Uh, they want to move to a climate that's more agreeable to them. They want to move nearer family. So we can offer a retirement program like a core flex that we're, uh, we have right now that allows them to choose what might be best for them. Maybe we do a home sale. Maybe we do a home purchase. We move their goods uh, and destination services. You know, it, it's a huge benefit. And it's like I said, it's it's gaining a lot of traction right now. So I'm curious, Bill, if you could just explain kind of, uh, I don't know if you've done any research on this, but, um, you know, what industries are going to be impacted the most by Peak 65? I think it's a broad spectrum uh, exactly, Zach, but certainly there's going to be uh, some that are impacted more than others because they're also high growth. So we have healthcare services, uh, social services, uh, social assistance, uh, as we have, you know, an aging population, hospitality, which is always active and growing. And uh, needless to say, even though I mentioned it third, tech, tech is going to be growing continuously, hugely, you know, for the foreseeable future. So those those are the three areas I see as having the most impact. And so for, you know, roughly a, a 2 million uh, employee gap or, you know, where we have 2 million vacancies roughly, you know, what are the, some of the ways that that gap could be filled? 
Well, you know, I talked about uh, ways that we can do that with uh, extending retirements for those uh, more seasoned workers. Uh, another important aspect is is dealing with immigration. Uh, and we're seeing certainly a, a huge growth in that right now. So we have people that are coming over to the U.S. to fill those gaps. They're highly skilled, they're highly educated, but they're not experienced in what goes on in particular industries or certainly within particular companies. So even though we're increasing the number of immigrants coming into the U.S., we are not able to plug them into new positions immediately. And that's, again, where we dovetail into talking about those nearing retirement and extending those retirements so they can offer the additional training for those that will be filling those places. So we talked about just generally, you know, what that gap is, uh, kind of how they're going to fill it with immigration and, you know, seeing if we can get these seasoned, um, you know, vets to stay on a little bit longer. Um, can you talk more specifically just about how we as a company and how us as an industry uh, can step in and, and help make that a reality? Absolutely. Yeah. NEI is well equipped to assist with immigration, certainly. You know, we have offices worldwide best-in-class international policies, and absolutely stellar partners throughout the globe. You know, we can facilitate immigration of qualified workers into the U.S. with our global mobility programs, includes coordinating with immigration providers, moving households and families, facilitating acclimation into the new location, and destination services, which we can't emphasize enough are how they're so critical. But we're talking about services like language, cultural training, finding the right schools, and uh, growing big, even uh, DE&I considerations. So I'm curious, Bill, if you had to predict, uh, what's one unexpected way uh, that Peak 65 might change the workplace culture or relocation trends? I think, uh, interestingly, as a culture, we don't have the respect that we should have for more experienced workers. And you take a country like Japan, where uh, experience is revered, where there is respect. I think what we're going to find more and more as time goes on that we understand the huge role that the experienced worker has in the workplace and how they are actually impacting what's happening there, the profitability, and certainly the the enjoyment of that workplace. That I think we're going to discover is a huge influence that those more experienced workers bring to us. That's a great answer. You know, I was thinking when you were talking about that, just how much more holistically that companies are going to have to think about, you know, their workforce, uh, given the fact that, you know, you need to you know, pass on knowledge, right? You need to train up the younger generation, you know, to be able to take over some of those high impact roles, right? Um, and then you have these, uh, you know, like when you talk about cultures and, you know, what kind of culture was built um, by this generation that's now retiring and what culture is um, the next generation going to sort of bring to those positions as well, you know? And so trying to sort of do this, this math and, you know, trying to figure out kind of like um, what benefits you have to offer um, the retirees so that you can get them to uh, stay long enough to pass over their knowledge and then what benefits the newer generation might be interested in, you know, it just seems like it, it is, sort of a, you have to start thinking really comprehensively about how you're going to navigate the future. What well, great point. You know, like, like, let's talk healthcare. Okay. More experienced workers. Healthcare is a critical aspect of a, a job decision. You know, what, what kind of benefits do you offer? What kind of benefit retirement, excuse me, retirement benefits you have? Do you have a 401k and so forth? Do you match uh, with a younger worker? It's what educational opportunities do you offer me? Are you going to pay for my uh, finishing my bachelor's degree or, or whatever, or moving on to my master's? Uh, opposite ends of the spectrum, but uh, I think HR departments are tasked with balancing the costs of both those types of programs. How often do, uh, you know, our clients reach out to us to uh, sort of game plan through some of these situations? Often. We spend a lot, and it's increasing, I should say, too. Uh, 
when we do annual reviews or we do uh, reviews every six months, uh, we used to spend, you know, if I'm going to say an hour's time, we'd spend 45 minutes talking about what happened last year. You had X number of moves and you had this number of exceptions and your bottom line was this percentage. Uh, now we do talk about those, but we spend a lot of time. I, I, it's absolutely reversed. I'll spend 15 minutes talking about what happened last year. And that additional 45 minutes is going to be what we're seeing in the industry, what's going on with the NAR settlement, what's happening with housing, uh, what about costs. We have a ship hit a bridge in Baltimore Harbor. What's that going to do to uh, getting your household goods to, uh, to EMEA? Those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with now. But I'd say, and as a simple answer, we're talking what's going to happen three to five years down the road and how can NEI facilitate taking care of those situations? What can we do as an organization to help our clients master those situations as they come down the road? So how important is it that companies, you know, look for flexibility um, in their relocation provider, given that, you know, it seems like you have to be so nimble uh, to account for all these increasing, you know, changes and shifts in the marketplace and, um, you know, in in the culture and how things are uh, working out economically. It's uh, flexibility is the word. Uh, good choice, Zach, because it is exactly what we're having to do. I say the, uh, you know, the old days again. When I talk about my years of experience, we had two policies, a renter and a homeowner, when we're, if we're talking U.S. domestic. And now we probably have five policies. And in the international scene, we have the same thing where we're moving more to, instead of a long-term, short-term perm, uh, we're talking about commuter policies, we're talking about rotational programs, we're talking about uh, probably a core flex, which has been around for years, but again, it's it's becoming the the normal instead of the exception. Um, an HR department maybe wants to uh, flex some of the benefits or we want the transferee or the assignee wants to flex benefits. Uh, it, it's an excellent way to customize a program without compromising, uh, again, DE and I considerations, making sure that we are not offering A to transferee B <laughs> or C and make sure that we are uh, actually showing somebody uh, the flexibility for a policy without having an issue with somebody getting this benefit and another person not getting that benefit. So I'm curious, Bill, we were talking about culture. What's the most interesting sort of cultural shift that you've seen uh, in the workplace as different generations prepare for retirement? If we're talking generational, I'd say um, it's it's if you walk around an office, at 5 p.m. and who's there and who's gone? And my question is, which one's the smarter one? <laughs> but you're gonna notice that the more experienced workers, uh, they're there till six, they're 6.30, seven o'clock. If they're working on something, they're gonna do it. Uh, the younger generations are looking more for, I'm gonna intensely work till five o'clock. And when five o'clock hits, I'm going home because my family is important to me. So like I said, I don't know which is the better of the two or which makes more sense, but that's probably the biggest difference I've seen uh, walking around an office and, and seeing what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a really good observation, actually. Um, how, how do you think... Um, because so, I know that, you know, different industries have different requirements on, you know, their employees and stuff like that. Um, when we were looking at, you know, peak 65 and that generation retiring and a potential, you know, new culture coming in where it's like, you know, we're going to work really hard. And then once uh, it hits five, we're gone. How does that impact like a service industry versus, you know, maybe like an auto manufacturing industry or something like that? You know, do are we going to see um, you know, companies feel that in different ways uh, based on the types of services or products that they provide? I'm not sure they're going to see a difference in the products they provide. That's a really interesting question, though, Zach. So I, I might have to crystal ball that one a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think our service industry might be a great example. 
uh, we're going to have account executives that at five o'clock, they're done for the day. They've arranged. And again, I'm talking working intently all day long. And then at five o'clock, they go home. All of them have cell phones. I have a cell phone. And when somebody in EMEA or APEC says, I've got an issue and it's an emergency, they're going to call. So even if I leave at five o'clock, I'm still available for those important calls or important emails because my phone also is connected to my Outlook and I'm going to get that email from somebody and it's going to be 11 p.m. at my time uh, and they need something done immediately. And we rally the resources to do that. So from a service industry, we can't have the luxury of really clocking out and going home. There's too you said many you read my mind, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's true. Like I, I think that what it comes down to is like a communication issue, you know. So like, um, I'm certainly part of the that younger generation, but I understand the the requirements of the job, you know. And you know, if something needs to get done, it's like this is what doing a good job a good job looks like in this uh, position, right? And I, you know, we know that our account executives, that they're always available to their, um, the transferring employees, right? So it's that just setting up those expectations so that everyone's on the same page. And, um, you know, I think that that is one of the biggest things is like, yes, you may have these cultural these cultural idiosyncrasies, but they can be overcome or you can come to better understanding just with better communication. It is certainly a beast of an industry, you know. It is. And um, I think maybe if I was going to sum up something here is that uh, as a client relations manager, I think it's critical for my clients that I remain on the forefront of knowledge of what's happening within the industry and outside of the industry. There's so much that happens politically. Uh, you know, we suddenly there's a change in London about how we are supposed to do leases. And we have an uprising in Kenya. And how many people do we have there that we need to get out on an emergency basis? You know, there is so much going on that as a client relations manager and certainly hand in hand with our operations team is we're taking care of our clients. Our clients entrust us with the care of their people. And we are an arm of that HR department. You know, we're not a supplier, we're not a vendor, we're a partner. And at NEI, I take that extremely seriously, we, we all do. And so we need to take care of our people, we need to take care of our clients and those that they entrust us to. So it's an awesome responsibility and things like we're talking about today are those that we need to get in front of. Uh, we've got, you know, five years or less really before this may impact seriously. It's already impacting, but it's going to, we're gonna reach the fruition of those retirement ages. And what can we do to help our clients with the impact that's gonna have for them? That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Bill, for coming on Relocation Leader. We've certainly enjoyed having you. And now that we all know what Peak 65 is and how to handle it, um, I'm sure we're gonna be much better off. <laughs> Well, thank you, Zach. Always a pleasure to talk to you. That was another episode of Relocation Leader. Make sure you check out all of our other videos at NEI All Access, and we'll see you next time. Join the conversation and hear from more leaders in the world of global mobility. Sign up for NEI All Access today by visiting neirelo.com slash all access.